Hello and welcome to a review of pertinent drug information for SARS-CoV-2 from the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists. My name is Jen Richardson and I am an antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist and clinical coordinator at Mercy Health St. Anne Hospital in Toledo, Ohio. Today I will be discussing ascorbic acid and its potential therapeutic role in severe COVID-19. The data are updated as of April 17, 2020. Because of little available data concerning any individual agent's effectiveness in treating COVID-19, my plan for this presentation is to piece together information to tell the story of ascorbic acid. We'll talk about roles of ascorbic acid in the body, deficiency in septic states, discuss proposed improvements in disease biomarkers or clinical condition, and any role specifically relating to viruses to end up with an overall recommendation for its use in COVID-19. Ascorbic acid, or vitamin C, is a water-soluble cofactor involved in a variety of essential biochemical reactions within the human body. Its effectiveness as an antioxidant is due to its ability to readily donate electrons shifting between two primary forms. It can reduce metals such as copper and iron and has been shown to regenerate other antioxidants such as vitamin E. Under normal physiological conditions, an ascorbate radical may be formed, but it seems this free radical is comparatively unreactive and can be easily reduced back to the L-ascorbic acid form. Ascorbic acid is also required for the synthesis of collagen, carnitine, and endogenous catecholamines such as norepinephrine and dopamine. These processes and more have been primarily demonstrated in vitro, but precise roles that vitamin C plays in vivo is uncertain. Unlike many animals, humans cannot synthesize this essential nutrient and it must be obtained exogenously. Due to its water-soluble nature, it is not effectively stored. Signs of vitamin C deficiency due to little or no intake can occur within four weeks. Reference ranges vary slightly, but less than approximately 11.4 micromoles per liter, or less than 0.2 milligrams per deciliter, is deemed to indicate deficiency. Reduced levels of ascorbic acid in critically ill and septic patients have been described in multiple publications. This depletion appears to occur from the role of scavenging free radicals in reactive oxygen species that are overproduced during immune activation and inflammation of critical illness, and by inhibition of the reduction of dehydroascorbic acid back to ascorbic acid. Experimental models describe extensive involvement of ascorbic acid throughout the body, and certainly deficiency in shock states could describe some of the things we see in these patients. For example, its antioxidant role at the molecular level provides reasoning for capillary leak. Its role in collagen formation and role in catecholamine synthesis may lead to decreased vascular tone and hypotension. Immunosuppression is also suggested in states of deficiency. Cells of the immune system have very high concentrations of vitamin C, and during sepsis, ascorbic acid is thought to potentially mitigate the cytokine surge consequence of accumulating neutrophils in the lung, thus working to prevent the destruction of alveolar capillaries. Septic shock is characterized by resistant hypotension and abnormalities in cellular metabolism, and it continues to be postulated that the therapy addition of vitamin C should approve these conditions. Dosing, frequency, and duration of ascorbic acid is not specifically determined for any prophylactic or treatment regimen of any condition. IV doses of 2 to 3 grams per day have been shown to normalize plasma concentrations in critically ill patients. IV dosing has been shown to produce much higher levels than oral or enteral administration. Additionally, rapid renal clearance of IV therapy lends to the rationale of multiple daily dosing schedules. I included some pharmacokinetic data reported by Patty Eddy and colleagues showing plasma concentration differences in IV and PO dosing in healthy subjects. Oral is listed on top and IV is on the bottom. And take a second to see where one gram dose falls for each. Note that the y-axis is micromoles for oral and millimoles for IV. For those who hate math, one millimole is 1,000 micromoles. Systemic dose finding during critical illness has not been performed. High doses such as 10 to 200 grams per infusion have been administered to oncology and burn patients, and malignancy studies suggest maximal radical scavenging at levels perhaps as high as 10 times normal. But regarding ideal dosing of ascorbic acid for septic patients, we have more questions than answers at this point. To provide some dose answers, Wang and colleagues performed a meta-analysis published in 2019. The predefined primary outcome included all-cause mortality at final follow-up. The authors concluded that IV ascorbic acid doses of 3 to 10 grams per day significantly reduced the mortality of critical illness, and doses above or below this had no mortality benefit. I think worthy of mentioning is that mortality was measured at whatever endpoint the original study defined. Twelve studies here included 1,210 patients, with about half receiving ascorbic acid. Of these 12 studies, five trials were randomized, with an additional three listed as quasi-randomized, and only four evaluated severe sepsis or septic shock. 
Additionally, only one sepsis study had a mortality had mortality as a primary endpoint, which was the Merrick 2017 study in which patients also received hydrocortisone and thiamine, or the HAT protocol as it may be referred to. Initial analysis of the data showed that receipt of ascorbic acid did not affect mortality regardless of indication. They then separated the data by dose and found overall mortality benefit in the medium dose group, which was not indication specific. They then performed another subgroup evaluation and after removing an outlier trial, now leaving just three, determined that a mortality benefit was seen in sepsis patients who received ascorbic acid. These two results are illustrated on this slide with the left side of each graph favoring ascorbic acid administration. Secondary information presented in this meta-analysis is not discussed here because this really was a heterogeneous mixture of patient populations using small studied studies with varied methods and treatments. One study in the Wang meta-analysis provided the impetus for the Citrus Alley trial that we will discuss shortly. In 2014, Fowler and colleagues performed a small safety study of 26 patients to evaluate potential adverse reactions in severely septic patients receiving IV ascorbic acid. This was a safety trial to look at incidence of hypotension, tachycardia, hypernatremia, and nausea and vomiting in septic patients receiving IV ascorbic acid. They looked at doses of 50 mg per kilogram and 200 mg per kilogram per 24 hours for four days. No patients were withdrawn due to adverse events and the authors concluded that low and high dose ascorbic acid therapy is safe. They collected additional data and subsequently reported trends in C-reactive protein, procalcitonin, as well as change in SOFA scores, which favored this vitamin C group, reaching numeric statistical significance. Differences in thrombomodulin was not found. Lack of adjustment of co-founding factors such as timing of appropriate antibiotics and other patient characteristics is an important factor that must be considered when evaluating these results. Another hypothesis was tested by Zappet and colleagues that administration of high-dose ascorbic acid would reduce vasopressor requirements in surgical critically ill patients compared with placebo. This was a small, single-center, randomized, double-blind trial of 28 patients with about half receiving treatment. High-dose was defined as 25 mg per kilogram IV every six hours for 72 hours. Vasopressor dose and duration were the primary outcomes which are shown here. The authors reported that patients in the treatment group had a significantly lower mean and total norepinephrine dose within the first 24 hours, as well as a lower duration of norepinephrine use. Although not a primary endpoint, they also found a significant reduction of 28-day mortality in the treatment group. Dr. Fowler and his colleagues attempted to add to the data pool and investigated if ascorbic acid infusion affects organ failure or, or biomarkers of inflammation and vascular injury in the Citrus Alley trial published in JAMA in 2019. This randomized trial was double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-centered, and included 167 ICU patients with sepsis and ARDS, with the primary outcome of determining if ascorbic acid infusion would reduce SOFA scores at 96 hours, or C-reactive protein or thrombomodulin levels at 168 hours. Their SOFA scores were calculated without bilirubin. Patients with sepsis who developed acute respiratory failure in the preceding 24 hours were randomized to receive ascorbic acid 50 mg per kilogram IV every 6 hours or placebo for 96 hours. The results showed no significant difference in any of the primary endpoints, all with numeric values matching almost completely between the groups. They did go on to report on 46 secondary outcomes. 43 of these 46 outcomes were not significantly different, but the investigators did report significant improvements in mortality at 28 days, ICU-free days at 28, and hospital-free days at 60 days. Although the investigators performed a good study to add to our pool of data, the secondary outcomes just mentioned must be viewed as hypothesis generating. Without adjusting for co-founding factors, the possibility of errors of chance are quite high and can influence each other. For example, the mortality endpoint was a likely driver of ICU and hospital day endpoints. From a pure standpoint, this is a negative study as the primary endpoints were not met. So far, we have not seen any scenario where the administration of ascorbic acid alone has proven clinical benefit in critically ill septic patients. Its use in combination with thiamine and hydrocortisone, or HAT therapy, was reported by Merrick and colleagues in a retrospective before and after single center study published in CHEST in 2017. The primary outcome was hospital survival. Treatment group patients with a primary diagnosis of sepsis or septic shock and a procalcitonin of two or greater were treated with HAT within 24 hours of ICU admission. Seven months of the treatment group with the added therapy were compared against a control group of patients treated in the preceding seven months with their standard care. The control group did not receive IV vitamin C or thiamine. There were 47 patients in each group. 
The treatment group received usual care, plus IV vitamin C 1.5 grams IV every six hours for four days, or until ICU discharge, hydrocortisone 50 milligrams every six hours for seven days, or until ICU discharge, and thiamine 200 milligrams IV every 12 hours for four days, or until ICU discharge. The authors reported that hospital mortality was 8.5% in the treatment group versus 40.4% in the control group. The propensity adjusted odds of mortality in the patients treated with the vitamin C protocol was 0.13, and thus the primary endpoint was met. Although much hard work was done here also, many weaknesses are present, such as a small size and retrospective nature. The investigators were also keenly aware of the patients being studied with the new therapy. Also, 59.6 of the patients in the control group were treated with hydrocortisone. They did report some additional secondary findings that were numerically significant, but these were also not adjusted and unfortunately the same limitations just discussed apply. Another study looking at combination therapy was published in JAMA in 2020 by Fuji and colleagues. This was a multi-centered, open-label, randomized trial that compared ascorbic acid, hydrocortisone, and thiamine in the same doses as the just discussed Merrick study versus IV hydrocortisone, 50 milligrams, every six hours alone. Patients received therapy until shock resolution or up to 10 days. Patients who met septic shock definition were enrolled within 24 hours and randomized to therapy. All patients were on vasopressors for at least two hours prior to enrollment. 216 were enrolled and 211 were included for analysis. The primary outcome of this trial was duration of time alive and off vasopressors up to day seven. The authors concluded that in patients with septic shock, vitamin C, hydrocortisone, and thiamide did not significantly approve time alive or vasopressor free over seven days compared with IV hydrocortisone alone. They pre-specified 10 secondary outcomes of which nine showed no difference. On day three, there was a one point difference in SOFA scores that statistically favored the treatment group. No difference in other secondary outcomes such as vent free days or 28 or 90 day mortality were found. The study had good protocol compliance and although still a small open label trial, it seems to refute the extreme findings reported in the before and after Merrick study. I have not been able to show ascorbic acid provides mortality benefit or that it improves biomarkers of inflammation or vascular injury in septic patients. I thought it was worthy to look at any data talking specifically about vitamin C's effect on viruses in general. I'm sure you're expecting inconclusive data here and I won't disappoint you. There has been some exploration to try to determine if vitamin C can directly protect or treat pneumonia caused by some influenza viruses, but so far there's been nothing to support that vitamin C is directly viricidal in vivo. As you can imagine, if we haven't found an answer for disease states that we've encountered for years, we have no answers for such a novel process such as severe COVID-19 disease. Based on the data we have, it is unlikely that ascorbic acid is viricidal against SARS-CoV-2, and since we have a difficult time proving benefit and attenuating host responses in other clinical presentations of sepsis, that we should likely not assume a benefit in severe COVID-19 illness. We hope to get more information within the year. Multiple studies are underway investigating ascorbic acid in septic patients. A China study is trialing 24 grams per day of IV vitamin C to treat patients with coronavirus and severe respiratory complications. Many of these trials can be found on clinicaltrials.gov. Because we want desperately to try something, ascorbic acid is being used by some centers. The argument may include something like it's likely safe, so why not? So let's briefly talk about that. To date, I'm unaware of any trials illustrating adverse effects with ascorbic acid and administration at a wide range of doses. Items to consider include the potential for kidney stone formation in predisposed individuals, unpredictable interference with point of care devices such as glucose devices leading to unreliable readings, G6PD deficient individuals may have an increased risk of hemolysis and reduced doses are recommended, and drug interactions are rare but cyclosporine levels may be reduced. Regarding the cost of therapy, a high dose regimen of 50 milligrams per kilogram IV every six hours for four days would incur a medica medication cost of about $300 or more. Although not in the expense realm of therapies such as interleukin-6 receptor antagonists, given the high prevalence of sepsis, if protocolized, use of this agent could result in significant spending overall. So as I begin to wrap up the presentation, I think it is prudent to also mention that societal guidelines do not comment on the use of ascorbic acid in sepsis with or without ARDS or with COVID-19 with or without ARDS. So despite lack of societal support or great data, I am asked to dose ascorbic acid. What dose would I recommend? If I could not convince the team that this is not a proven intervention, I would likely respond as follows. Due to product availability and cost, I think it is reasonable to suggest 1.5 grams IV Q6 hours for a total of 6 grams per day. 
and I'm largely basing this on total body store estimation of 1.5 grams, doses used to normalize levels in pharmacokinetic studies, and the Wang meta-analysis. I do not feel there is support for higher doses in septic shock or COVID-19 illness. My rationale is very weak, but I would argue that there is no high dose data to hang one's hat on either. My goal is the restoration of normal levels and not targeting massive plasma levels at this time. I additionally would like to be mindful of drug supplies. Vitamin C is a nutrient involved in essential human processes that has shown to be depleted in critically ill patients. The consequences of this depletion are mechanistically plausible, but still being largely theoretical. The hope that vitamin C may attenuate the inflammation and vascular injury associated with sepsis and ARDS is yet unproven. The complex condition of sepsis makes the study of individual agents very difficult and the perfect cocktail is yet unknown. Perhaps ascorbic acid studies need to evaluate different surrogate markers of inflammation and injury, or maybe there's a golden hour for therapy initiation. What is a goal level in sepsis? And does this need to be used in combination? But in the end, we must be cautious about putting too much emphasis on secondary outcomes or technically flawed small studies, especially in consideration of global practice changes. In conclusion, from a purist standpoint, the available data do not support the routine use of ascorbic acid for septic shock with or without ARDS, and there are no data to support its use in patients presenting with severe coronavirus disease. With multiple studies currently underway, we will hopefully soon have more pieces to this complicated puzzle. Thank you for your time.